do is kind of introduce myself first and kind of highlight what it is I'm going to do. Uh, and then we, there'll be regular uh, points at which I will stop and we can have some discussions. Obviously, I'm not trying to present um, the correct way of reading these films. I, I'm very much hoping that as, as happened in the earlier session, there'll be some really good um, conversations and really good responses and ways in which we can get deeper into this topic during the Q&A. Knowledge is constructed collaboratively, so let us create a new kind of weird assemblage together. Um, please do um, put all of your comments, questions, queries, critiques, and other uh, responses in the chat as well, and it'll be great to, to build that as another collaborative resource. Big thing, first of all, um, as with the last class that I did, I've tried to avoid too much explicit violence, um, that, but we are talking about body horror. We're talking about bodily violence. There is going to be some blood, guts, and gore. Um, I've tried to be careful in the clips that I have selected to show. Um, uh, and I think I did a pretty good job. Uh, the people who are this, here this morning, I think uh, maybe there's nothing, too, there's nothing too horrible there. But if there are things that people are a little bit sensitive about, before I introduce each clip, I will flag that up so you can, if you want, just mute the video or just you know, minimize things and not have, to, not have to see that until you're ready to come back. And that is, of course, absolutely fine. So uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is John. I am a, uh, currently a postdoctoral researcher in a theology and religious studies department. I'm also uh, a uh, Marxist and a cultural critic. Uh, I write at the haunt.blog and the, and am the co-host of the horror podcast, Horror Vanguard, which is about leftist politics, horror movies, and defeating the great monster that is capitalism. You can find me on Twitter and YouTube at The Liquid Guy. And um, if you want to help keep me in PDFs and uh, at the moment, uh, uh, an excellent uh, uh, beer from uh, uh, one of the, my favorite Manchester brewers, uh, my tip jar is up there as well. So what are we going to talk about? Very uh, kind of briefly, we're going to have a, a quick bloody history of body horror. I want to talk a little bit about body horror on film before we get into the work of David Cronenberg. I'm, I am by no means a Cronenberg expert. I'm just a big fan. And I think uh, it's important to, to, to say that, I, again, I'm not trying to put forward a kind of the only way of reading things. Because this, this brings up some sort of meta level or more theoretical questions, right? If we're talking about questions of categorization and periodization, we are always talking about uh, history. We're talking about how do we understand things historically uh, and to try and understand a phenomena as it has developed throughout cultural history is in some ways to make choices about how we understand history in total. So definitions are complex, contested, genealogies are often riven with tensions and are contradictory. Body horror is not one thing. You know, there are lots of ways of reading it and I really hope that in the Q&A and in the chat, people will add to what I'm trying to say um, because I don't think that those multiple discourses are in any way, uh, you know, in conflict, but deep in our appreciation for the topic. Um, the, the, the line that I want to take though, the experiment that I want to put forward is that body horror is irreducibly connected to technology, particularly in the work of David Cronenberg. Um, because I want us to have a chance to, to sort of rethink the relationship between bodily subjectivity and technology. And I think his work is very helpful for doing that. So what do I mean by this? Uh, if we go back to the 18th century, we have a technology printing, we have the rise of representational realism and what I, I've termed the construction of the subject in literary form. The novel, as we would recognize it today, uh, it has its, has its kind of originary point, or arguably one of its originary points, in the 1700s. A uh, really good book to read on this is Ian Watts's uh, kind of landmark study, The Rise of the Novel. It's one of those books that people have kind of made their career off disagreeing with, which is how you know it's a good academic book. So at the same time as we see the emergence of a kind of um, uh, literary realism, or what we would come to, to consider to be realism in the, in the great three-volume works of the 19th century, there's this rise of pornography uh, that S S Susan Sontag has written about this quite extensively and a huge amount of work which is gratuitously violent and exploitative. 
uh, you know, obviously the the uh, the great examples here would be uh, the Penny Dreadfuls, which reached their heyday in the mid uh, 19th century. Uh, but also things like the work of John Wilmot, the Earl of Rochester, and of course the infamous Libertine, the Marquis de Sade. So if we're going to pick a, uh, a kind of starting point for our discussion, I think we could do a lot worse than start with um, the monk, the, the, the wonderful, lurid, absurdly over-the-top novel from 1796 by uh, Matthew Lewis. And here we have a very famous scene uh, that is in so many ways uh, a kind of embodiment of all of the best and worst things about body horror. So um, it's, a, it's a prioress at the, at the abbey at the nunnery who is surrounded by a crowd of rioters. They, they uh, heeded nothing but the gratification of their barbarous vengeance. Uh, the, the riot turns ever more violent as the passage goes on. At length, a flint aimed by some well-directing hand strikes this unfortunate woman full upon the temple. She sinks upon the ground, bathed in blood, and in a few minutes terminated her miserable existence. Yet, though she no longer felt their insults, the rioters still exercised their impotent rage upon her lifeless body. They beat it, trod upon it and ill-used it till it became no more than a mass of flesh, uns unsightly, shapeless, and disgusting. I think it's important to flag up that body horror is in no way new. We have, we have the semiotic markers of body horror already uh, in one of the very earliest horror novels. Uh, a kind of excess of violence, an absolute surplus of violence being visited upon the fragile body. Let's have another very famous example, this time from Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, the sequence in which Victor um, completes his construction of the creature. Um, how, how can I describe my emotions at this catastrophe, he says, or how I delineate the wretch whom with such infinite pains and care I had endeavoured to form? His limbs were in proportion, and I had selected his features as beautiful, beautiful, great God. His yellow skin scarcely covered the work of muscles and arteries beneath. His hair was of a lustrous black and flowing, his teeth a pearly whiteness, but these luxuriances only formed a more horrid contrast with his watery eyes that seemed almost of the same color as the dun white sockets in which they were set, his shriveled complexion and straight black lips. So here again, we have another kind of body, another, another way of articulating the very specific kind of horror that a body can generate. So I want to sort of try and pull back from those two examples just for a moment and talk a little bit about how do we respond to the body in horror? Because um, the Gothic and horror, uh, horror more generally puts a, a really high emphasis on bodily fragility. Um, and perhaps we need to get away from this hierarchy of emotional response that puts a sublime terror at the top. Um, I mean, Stephen King writes about this, that really the kind of lowest reaction that a horror writer might go for is, is to gross you out, is to, to give you something gross and disgusting. And obviously this is a, this is a kind of rearticulation of the contested Burkean uh, aesthetics that was very prevalent in the late 18th century. But really, maybe we need to get away from this idea that terror is a kind of sublime emotion and is disconnected from, from the physical. Uh, and maybe we need to be uh, okay with the fact that actually bodily horrors and terrors have been built into the Gothic from their very beginning. There's a great, great quote here from the, the book Body Gothic by um, Xavier Aldana Reyes, who says that Gothic bodies produce fear through their interstitiality. They're scary because they either refuse absolute human taxonomies or they destabilize received notions of what constitutes a quote unquote normal or socially intelligible body. Um, uh, if we think back to our examples, we can actually absolutely see that in, in, in action, right? The, the body of the nun is reduced to something that is outside of those human taxonomies. It's, it's a kind of mush. It's no, even, no longer even recognizable as a body. And uh, Frankenstein's uh, creature that is pieced together from the charnel houses and cemeteries of, uh, of Ingolstadt 
uh, is not really socially intelligible. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't, uh, there's a there's kind of aesthetic disjoint in the creature's body. So uh, it's this term that Aldana Reyes uses is corporeal excess as the mark of Gothic writing. So in the same age that we see the kind of emergence of realist writing about subjectivity, um, you know, Samuel Richardson, even the sort of proto postmodernism of someone like Tristan Shandy, Lawrence Stern rather, we also see the essential uncontrollability of the body, which I think is a kind of useful thing to, to, to keep in mind as we go through the history that I'm, I'm, I wanna kind of put together for us. So really, I, I kind of put, this, put on this slide, the body is a kind of problem. Um, we have these two wildly different examples of the body as, a, as, a, as serving a purpose in the nexus of horror. You know, there's these tensions between the public and the private, one death and one bodily violence, body horror moment is incredibly public. The other is very privatized. Something uh, going on here with the, the, the tensions between the obliteration of the body and the construction of a new kind of subject. And what I think is very interesting in a lot of that early section of Frankenstein is this idea of kind of moral aesthetics. Because of the way the creature looks, because of the aesthetic response that, that, that Victor has, he makes moral assumptions about the creature. Uh, so and in contrast to the revenge and retributive model of violence that's enacted upon the body uh, in the monk. And, and the way that I kind of try and sort of think about this is that the body kind of represents a surplus of meaning. Meaning emerges from within, as in the piecing together of the body uh, in the case of Shelley's Frankenstein, and it can be forcibly inscribed upon a body from without, as in, the horrendous violence uh, visited to the nun in the monk. So this raises a kind of important question for horror as people who engage with this cultural form, which is what is the body and what does that make us? If there is this surplus of meaning, if there is this um, kind of um, excess to the corporeal, uh, that raises some kind of interesting problems that I think it's worth uh, trying to think through. So I want to sort of introduce a sort of philosophical idea here, uh, which is borrowing from the work of Bernard Stiegler, who's a French phenomenologist and philosopher who died quite recently. Um, and Stiegler says that humans are essentially prosthetic creatures. Unlike lots of other creatures, we, we put on things to ourselves in order to help our survival. Uh, the, the most kind of uh, immediately obvious one would be the one that you can all probably see on my face, which is glasses. These are, these are a, a technological prosthetic. Um, the other claim that Stiegler makes is that technology is constitutive of our being and co-emergent with our existence as a species. Um, the term that he uses is technics. And by this, we could, we could talk about, you know, the computer through which I'm talking to you, the microphone I'm using, we could even talk about things like uh, uh, the clothing that I'm wearing or the glasses that I have, or uh, even the language that I'm using is a kind of technology. Uh, another thing I, I wanna introduce is the concept of his three layers of memory. We have primary memory, which is often genetic, uh, evolutionary, a kind of holdover of instinctual behaviors, secondary memory, which is consciousness, but there is also what he calls tertiary memory. So that's a memory which endures beyond our own existence. Uh, and that is what we use technology for. It's a kind of externalization of consciousness. Um, and if we consider language to be a kind of technology, uh, books certainly are. So um, I'm just looking at the books that I have on my desk. I have a copy of uh, Sarah Ahmed's Living a Feminist Life. Um, and eventually, Sarah, in the future, both I and Sarah Ahmed will no longer be living. But part of the kind of memory, her interpretation, her philosophy endures thanks to the technology that forms a kind of collective tertiary memory that is books. So tertiary memory is in technology, particularly written language, but also cinema. And what does this mean for body horror? So one way I wanna put forward of kind of thinking about the horror of, of our bodies and the, the fragility and contingency of them is this idea of a stripping away of the techniques, the, the various uh, 
technologies that we put onto ourselves, the ways in which we use technology to shape the world, we're left with a malleable, contingent, fragile flesh rather than consciousness. As um, somebody in the uh, previous session put it, we are, uh, you know, tubes of meat, which is a kind of disquieting thought. And it runs counter to a great deal of philosophical understandings of human subjectivity. Uh, you know, classically Cartesian dualism would make a separation between the mind or the soul, where, which is the seat of consciousness and the body, which is a kind of physical thing. Um, but we know that that's a kind of, there's an integrative system there. There are ways in which these various disparate elements interact. So body horror is the antithesis of a vision of subjectivity as a coherent unity. Let's, let's kind of jump ahead a little bit from our very famous examples and think about body horror in the late 19th century. We have three great crises in the 19th century intellectual imagination precipitated by the works of Darwin, Marx, and later on Freud. So Darwin displaces man as, uh, as created by God, Marx displaces capital as created for merit, and Freud even shows that within ourselves, we're not, we do not cohere. There are fractures, tensions, contradictions within one mind. We are divided against ourselves in many ways. And these anxieties get played out in the corporeal transgressions of horror. Uh, there's a triptych of novels there, um, H.G. Wells, The Island of Dr. Moreau, Stevenson, Jekyll and Hyde, Richard Marsh's The Beetle, which are full of these concerns about uh, kind of post-Darwinian anxiety. If, uh, you know, if the body can evolve into something new, the danger is that it can, can also devolve into something worse. Uh, Wells, of course, was very interested, very interested, as lots of late 19th and early 20th century intellectuals were, in eugenics, because this is the this is the inverse of the degeneration thesis. Um, Max Nordau's very famous uh, kind of colossal book uh, that articulated a lot of these anxieties. So uh, eugenics was seen as can we perfect the evolutionary processes, and it reaches its apotheosis the nightmarish uh, uh, doctrines of, of uh, Nazi Germany. But there is this initial anxiety that gets played out in what can the body become in the late 19th century? And how do we understand and classify and taxonomize the body if we don't have this unitary vision of a singular subject anymore? If the subject fractures, what does that mean? I want to stop there very briefly, just to see if there are any responses to that very brief overview, that little introduction of, of some uh, kind of maybe slightly more philosophical ways of thinking about uh, body horror. But I'd like to ask everybody, do you, do you enjoy body horror uh, and why? So yes, yes or no. And if, if no, why not? And if yes, why? Because I really think that will help guide uh, some of our future discussions as well. So the kind of argument that I want to make is that film, in a way, allows for a more explicit articulation of the phenomenological or affective impact that gothic and horror has always sought to generate. Uh, as, as, as Jonathan pointed out, horror wants to do things to your body. It wants to create physical responses. Uh, you know, the, 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 the hair on the back of your neck stands on end. You jump, you feel queasy, you feel... Uh, your heart races, you get goosebumps. And there's a lot of that that's very frightening, but there is a kind of um, jouissance. There is, there, is a, there is a libidinal pleasure that runs through it as well, which is, I think, partly uh, to do with the attraction of horror movies for a lot of people for the first time, is that um, kind of libidinal thrill that they can generate. So let us, let's, let's kind of have a look at this uh with maybe one of the this is a kind of classic uh creature feature let us see uh the trailer for the blob featuring an adorably young steve mcqueen um just gonna make sure that i'm sharing sound as well so that we don't have any tech issues there we go steve Doc Hallen's been killed. Doc Hallen? What happened? It's over at his place. You gotta come now. Oh, wait a minute, Steve. Tell us what happened. Well, I'm trying to tell you. Now, this thing had killed the doc. Well, what was it? Stop with it, kid. But it's kind of like a... It's kind of like a mass that keeps getting bigger and bigger. It... <laughs> Hey, 
every one of you watching this screen, look out. Because soon, very soon, the most horrifying monster menace ever conceived will be oozing into this theater. Teenagers see it first, like a falling star from outer space. Boy, that was close. Hey, come on. I want to see if I can find it. An old man finds it, touches it, and this is the shocking result. From then on, there's no stopping the blob as it spreads from town to town. It's indestructible. It's indescribable. Nothing can stop it. This town is in danger. How can it be stopped? Mob hysteria sweeps one city. Before long, the nation, and then the world could fall before the blood-curdling threat of the Bob. Starring Steve McQueen and a cast of exciting young people. Oh, what fun. What fun. Steve! There we go. Uh, Steve McQueen there, uh, looking basically the same <laughs> as, as he does, you know, in the, in the, in the highlight of his career. Um, but w- what's really interesting to me about the trailer is one of the first lines of the voiceover, which is the sense that not only are the characters on screen at risk, you and everybody else watching is at risk too. The blob is not just a threat to the internal world of the film, but you are physically in danger. Now, of course, we know that that's not the case, but it's very, it's, you know, but there is a a suspension of disbelief when we enter into the kind of position of a spectator uh, in which a lot of the power of these films derives from their ability to draw us in to what's happening on screen. Now, it's easily readable in a multitude of ways. The B-movie horror of the 50s and 60s has a clear political angle, the fear of the outsider and the other, um, you know, the blob is, is like, it's almost impossible to get away from reading it as a kind of blatant red scare narrative. But what I think is really worth pointing out is it's something that body horror comes back to again and again, is the equivalence made between the body politic of society at large and the transformations of the subjective body. Um, and this is a very long standing kind of tradition, right? So Think of, uh, well, the classic example is invasion of the body snatchers, right? The changes to the individual body represents a threat to the uh, body politic of America more generally. Ends with our our main character running down the highway, yelling into the camera, you're next, they're already here. And so the vulnerabilities of the body politic get played out or enacted upon the subjective body in the body horror film. And body horror reveals the anxieties about the human body being vulnerable to attack from uh, corporations, institutions, ideologies, and of course, other human beings. Uh, again, this, the, 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 the blob is going to absorb all of us and cause the breakdown of American civic life. Pretty, pretty clear to read that as, um, as a Cold War narrative. So a very quick uh, genealogy we have uh, as, as kind of starting points. Uh, we could start with the, uh, the, I think it's 45 second long silent film, Beheading the Chinese Prisoner, uh, which is an execution from the box to rebellion uh, as an on-screen death. Um, not one that I would advise you to go searching out. It's actually quite difficult to track down. Um, Haxan, witchcraft through the ages, spends a lot of its time exploring the various implements of torture and the ways in which uh, bodies are made to suffer uh, uh, through uh, through its narrative. We have um, uh, Boris Karloff and Bela Lugosi's The Black Cat, uh, which has a very infamous and very effective uh, scene of bodily torture. Uh, Terror is a Man from 1959 and the absolutely incredible uh, Eyes Without a Face from 1960. And hopefully these represent a kind of cool starting point for you. I'm going to show you um, a quick clip from the Black Cat. It's actually, it's not from the Black Cat itself, but is from uh, Bravo TV's 100 Scariest Moments. 
uh, which somebody in the previous class pointed out was a regular on American TV around, uh, around Halloween. Um, and the quality is not amazing, but it actually uh, kind of helps you get, get to grips with what this, why this scene is so impressive for, for a film made in the 1930s. And again, I want to return to this idea that body horror and, and violence towards the body is inherently tied up with technology not only because technology is how we construct ourselves and subjectivity is a technological process, but also representing body horror is something that depends upon technology as well. Uh, something that will become much more clear when we look at the practical effects of David Cronenberg. Uh, and we're also gonna watch just a little bit about um, Eyes Without a Face. So uh, from 100 Scariest Moments, a little clip about the black cat. It isn't a new invention, it isn't a product of certain technological advances in movie making because here we have what in a contemporary film would basically be a scene of torture being played out in a way that is incredibly explicit and suggestive but suggestive precisely because of what it doesn't show. Now that's partly to do with the technological limitations of the time but also it's to do with the ways in which film is designed to provoke these affective responses from us. That it's designed to get this empathetic sort of revulsion from us. Um, but The Black Cat is a great example of, of, of all of these semiotics of body horror are already in place. Um, in which case we should probably talk about something that's a little more contemporary. So let's jump forward a couple of decades. Um, and I thought this would be, this would be helpful is, um, to have a kind of introduction to Eyes Without a Face, uh, because uh, it's one film that it was not hugely well known outside of European cinema. Um, uh, so this is a little clip of one of my favorite film critics, Mark Kermode, talking about the film. And I think it will give a really good sense of why the film is uh, so kind of useful and interesting for what we want to discuss. Yeah, right, two examples of, the, of that taxonomy of of, of, a, of bodies which are not socially intelligible, to use that phrase from Aldana Reyes, right? Eyes without a face, the blank mask renders a, a, a body kind of anonymous and, and unidentifiable. Um, you know, facial, facial recognition software is a big kind of ethical problem. Uh, and how are we recognized technologically? We're recognized through our faces. Uh, you know, algorithms learn to distinguish subjects by facial, facial recognition patterns. So there is something kind of uh, to, 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 to be faceless is to be outside of the kind of social realm of what makes a body intelligible. And then of course, the removal of the skin uh, from the body is that you, you, uh, you again have become something that is not, uh, is no longer the same thing as a kind of norma normative quote unquote body. So I, I, I honestly think this idea of the kind of destabilized taxonomy of subjectivity that uh, Aldana, Reyes, Aldana Reyes uh, points out is actually really useful for understanding uh, body horror on film. Um, very quickly, I'm, I, I wanna kind of run through, uh, just gonna have a quick look at the time. Yeah, let's, I'll, I'll run through this kind of first introduction to David Cronenberg and then we can maybe have a slightly more extended uh, discussion uh, before we lead into the final section where we're gonna look at it, some of his films in a little bit more detail. So David Cronenberg, born 1943 in Toronto, Canada, uh, gets his start making films thanks to time in the English department at UOT, uh, was originally going to be an entomologist, was very interested in insects and biology and ended up watching a film screening which had some of his friends in it and then transferred into English to get started with filmmaking. Um, films in the 70s were mostly financed through tax write-offs in the Canadian government because uh, there, there was a loophole in Canadian tax law, which meant that if you gave money to a film studio, it was basically a tax write-off. And it was a way of making sure that the Canadian film studios were, were able to keep going. And later work was plagued by financing issues, uh, leading him to uh, announce a few years ago, he was retiring from making films. Although as someone in the earlier session pointed out, um, it seems like he's got the financing for uh, a new film, which is looking like a very sh strange film noir style project. Um, so some of the kind of literary influences, uh, William Burroughs, uh, J.G. Ballard, um, he says that his work kind of falls between Vladimir Nabokov and William Burroughs, which is a really interesting uh, pair to choose 
Uh, Ballard is a big influence. Uh, he, he makes an extremely interesting adaptation of Ballard uh, uh, work, Crash. And of course, Philip K. Dick and Ray Bradbury is the pioneers of kind of futuristic science fiction. In a neat callback to the previous talk that I, I did a few weeks ago, he was also a big fan of EC Comics uh, when he was younger. Uh, as he put it, they were scary and bizarre and violent and nasty. The ones your mother didn't want you to have, which uh, I think is precisely the appeal of, of the, uh, the early EC Comics. He formed the Toronto Film Cooperative with Ivan Reitman, um, which is, is a genuinely amazing uh, uh, kind of uh, collaboration when you know that Reitman went on to be massively influential in mainstream 1980s film comedy, particularly the Ghostbusters franchise, um, which is just, just wonderful when you think that David Cronenberg, who makes very weird kind of art house cinema about bodies uh, being pals with Reitman, uh, he was also um, uh, considered to direct The Empire Strikes Back, uh, but Lucas eventually passed, which means that we never got to see what a David Cronenberg Star Wars movie would look like, um, which is just profoundly disappointing to me on so many levels. So he is this kind of weird melange of influences and styles, right? Um, it's very striking that a lot of his film work um, is taking the outsider position of, from the Hollywood mainstream, right? He's Canadian, he often works in Canada, uh, works with Canadian uh, creatives, and he tends to take a slightly more removed directorial style. He's very much an observant filmmaker. So we can break his, his uh, genealogy, a uh, kind of history of all of his work so far. The early work is the kind of pioneering splatter slash body horror. Uh, particularly worthy of attention is um, Shivers, Rabbit, uh, and The Brood. Scanners and Videodrome we're going to talk about in a little bit. Uh, 1991, he makes his absolutely bonkers adaptation of Naked Lunch, uh, which uh, also stars Peter Weller from Robocop, who uh, coincidentally has an art history PhD, which is why he wanted to do it. Um, it's very, very strange, because as, as Cronenberg said, if you really wanted to do an adaptation of uh, Naked Lunch, you would need a budget of about $450 million, and the film would be banned in every country on the planet. Um, so it's very, it's very interesting uh, uh, kind of way of dealing with a very problematic text. Uh, he started making gangster movies in the mid 2000s with a history of violence and Eastern promises, both which are particularly good. Uh, a Dangerous Method is actually one of my favorites of his recent work, which is a very kind of highbrow um, period piece uh, featuring uh, Carl Jung and uh, Freud. And then uh, in later uh, work is uh, Cosmopolis, the adaptation of a Don DeLillo uh, work and maps to the stars. That's everything he's done and nothing since 2014. So we can break that down into a kind of few categories. Um, we have uh, the classic body horror, the splatter films of his early work, which shift into a kind of elevation of the body horror form into something a bit more dramatically uh, nuanced. Uh, Naked Lunch, uh, M. Butterfly, Crash, and Spider are all somewhat kind of offbeat adaptations of uh, original work. Uh, this is maybe a slightly hot take that might get me into some trouble with Cronenberg fans, but I've described Existence as uh, Cronenberg's version of The Matrix, uh, and in a sense, uh, kind of calling back to both Scanners and Videodrome. Uh, History of Violence and Eastern Promises, his anthropological gangster phase, uh, where he's making films about uh, well, uh, Eastern Promises is set in London, History of Violence is in small town America. And then we have uh, his, his interest in the kind of apocalyptic Hollywood uh, with Maps of the Stars and Cosmopolis. But that is a kind of broad introduction. And I think we can stop there, uh, catch up on what the chat has to say and see if anyone has any questions that they would like to raise at this point. Good, we're sharing sound as well. Okay, so in Cronenberg's films, let's talk about Cronenbergian bodies. Um, and a very kind of easy way of starting is that the mind and the body are not the same thing, and one can influence the other in often hugely dramatic ways. Uh, in The Brood, uh, the fabulous Dr. Raglan, uh, played by Oliver Reed, specializes in psychoplasmics, 
where repressed emotions are manifested in uh, physiological changes. And the infamous scene from The Brood is uh, a woman giving birth through a psychoplasmic womb that is external to the body, uh, which she tears open and then licks clean uh, the child, which is covered in blood. Um, and in scanners, uh, those with psychokinetic powers can even kill people with their mind. Uh, which brings us to a very famous moment. Uh, you may have seen this just as a meme. You may have seen this uh, repeatedly. Uh, but let's, let's very briefly watch the kind of infamous scene from 1981's Scanners. So Scanners is, uh, is, is, is basically a conspiracy film, uh, a kind of thriller uh, that features uh, psychic, uh, psychics kind of battling one another. Um, it has a, a massive corporation, as quite a few of the early Cronenbergs do. Uh, and we are in the middle of a business meeting, which has, unbeknownst to the host of the meeting, been in infiltrated by someone with psychic abilities. <laughs> um, th perhaps the famous, the, the famous scene. And I, I, I think Scanners, um, Scanners suffers a little bit from, uh, as I say, a slightly incoherent uh, third act. It all gets a little bit messy as it tries to kind of tie up the various strands of its plot, but a really good introduction to the practical effects and the ways in which uh, the kind of style Cronenberg works with in order to try and draw us into the scene, right? There is uh, non-diegetic and diegetic elements at work in this little sequence that are designed to induce a kind of um, effective response from us, a physiological response. Um, I do wonder if this was anyone's first time seeing the exploding head from Scanners. Um, and I would very much encourage you to watch Scanners as a whole. It's a super interesting film. Um, but again, I just wanted to use that as a kind of like a, a, a mild introduction, as it were, uh, an appetizer. Um, but we're going to spend a little bit more time talking about uh, a couple of other Cronenberg films. Um, so let us jump ahead a little bit and let's talk about Videodrome. Um, so where does the meaning of horror come from? So a lot of intuitive criticism, a lot of kind of knee jerk reactions to it would say that meaning is something extrinsic to violence. You know, horror is just kind of mindless violence. But if we borrow Linda Williams' phrase about gross genres, horror, melodrama, and pornography, all of them are gross because they have a kind of surplus, right? Uh, uh, melodrama has a, has a surfeit of emotions. Pornography has uh, uh, an explicit rendering of sex. Horror has an explicit rendering of violence. There's an excess to them. Meaning is intrinsic to the spectacle depicted. Or in other words, if someone thinks horror movies are just meaningless violence, Let's watch David Cronenberg's movies together. Uh, and Videodrome, Drome, I think is super interesting precisely because it links back to these ideas from Bernard Stiegler that I was trying to outline at the beginning. The ways in which not only do, are we technological creatures, but we are in many ways made and remade by the technology and tools that we put onto ourselves. Uh, I don't really have much of a reason for showing the Videodrome original theatrical trailer, but it is an amazing slice of 80s nostalgia. So if you have never seen it, this is a great way uh, into the film, I think. Why would anybody watch a scum show like Videodrome? Why did you watch it, Max? Business reasons. Sure. What about the other reasons? Ren is a victim. I woke up with a headache. He What's has that? been exposed to Videodrome. I've been hallucinating for a while, ever since... What? Since I first saw Videodrome. His brain is already receiving video images. I think that massive doses of Videodrome signal will ultimately produce and control hallucination to the point that it will change human reality. Soon, his visions will coalesce and become uncontrollable flesh. Videodrome is seducing Max Rem. Please, 
come to me now. Come to Nikki. And Max Wren can do nothing to stop it. What makes you think I need help? None of our test subjects has returned to normality. Television can change your mind. Videodrome will change your body. Long live the new flesh. It will shatter your reality. Videodrome. Videodrome. Starring Deborah Harry and James Woods. A shocking new vision from the creator of Scanners. Coming soon to a theater near you from Universal. Why would anybody what watch fun uh if video drum is, is is i think my favorite david cronenberg film um and yes it has debbie harry in it um so james woods plays max who is the uh head of civic tv a an ultra high frequency tv broadcaster um and uh he stumbles across uh the video drone signal he is interested in something kind of provocative to drive up audiences and he decides to pirate Videodrome when he sees that what it's broadcasting is very explicit sex and what appears to be real life snuff films. Uh, he ends up watching uh, some of Videodromes on a tape with Nikki, his, uh, his girlfriend, played by Debbie Harry. And she immediately says she's going to audition for the show because that's what she was made for. Uh, he increasingly has a series of very bizarre hallucinations. Nikki disappears and is seen only on screens. Um, and he encounters uh, anyone who's seen it will know about the wonderful character of Dr. Brian Oblivion, uh, who's based on the Canadian media theorist Marshall McLuhan. Uh, and he encounters these tapes with Oblivion kind of explaining what's going on. Um, so some of the repeated themes here, we have kind of representation and reality, uh, media and technology, sex, pain, and the body. What is the relationship between perception and the body, and how does the body change um, as our perception and understanding of the world changes? So we're trying to track down the source of the transmissions. Max experiences a series of increasingly bizarre hallucinations. And this brings us back to the question of tertiary memory, and the question really of what is technology doing to us? And this, I think, is a question we don't necessarily like to think about or like to talk about. We, we have a very clear understanding of how technology is useful for us. But actually, one thing that I think Videodrome really helps us understand is that technology is, doesn't just constitute, constitute subjectivity itself. There is a dialectical relationship between ourselves and the techniques that surround us. Um, we don't just shape technology. We don't just use technology. Technology shapes us. Um, basically, uh, there is... There are, there are generations now who don't, don't live without an intimate connection to a cybernetic networked device. Uh, you probably have a phone close to hand. Uh, in fact, really, we could, we could probably start to think about phones and technology as basically being extensions of ourselves. So these kind of technologies close down potential future human expression, right? Uh, it would be very different. It would be very, it's almost unthinkable, really, to imagine a future without it but it also opens potential new ways of being, new kinds of existence, which is what Max starts to experience. So a little, a little more from uh, uh, Videodrome, and this is where uh, Max is watching one of the tapes of Dr. Brian Oblivion. Uh, and of course, uh, without giving too much away, uh, Nikki reappears towards the end of this little scene. Reality is something less than television. I think it, it, we might think that's really kind of a uh, controversial thing to say, but really less than a decade later, uh, Jean Baudrillard is writing the Gulf War did not take place. Of course, that essay didn't disavow the actual existence of the, of the first Gulf War in the, in the early 90s, but was making the point that it was mediated and experienced through the screen. You know, reality had become television. Uh, and I, 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 I honestly think even though the technology at play in Videodrome is really kind of outdated now, really the point that it's making is, is kind of shockingly contemporary. Um, and this idea of, we know for a fact, we know for a fact that um, 
uh, it's particularly internet technologies change the way that people think, change the, the sh and, and what this means is that it in effect manages to change the physical structure of the brain, rewires some connections, makes new connections, old connections uh, atrophy. Uh, so really we're not too far removed from a kind of video drone existence. Uh, we'll, we'll leave the very the pulsing tape for the moment. Uh, so Max begins to kind of experience physical changes. Uh, and as with most uh, early Cronenbergs, there is a conspiracy and he un uncovers uh, who's behind it. Um, and they uh, brainwash him. And one of the physical changes is, uh, as we are about to see, uh, the infamous torso tape player. Um, so he's being confronted by one of the people who works for this shadowy organization that's using Videodrome to try and... Uh, get rid of a, a, a kind of morally degenerate population. You know, the kind of people who would watch this are the kind of people this corporation, this, this shadow organization doesn't want to keep around. And they want to brainwash Max. So this is where, this is where we are at. Uh, he he uh, rebels against the, uh, the corporation. Uh, it's, uh, its front corporation is spectacular optical that makes uh, glasses another bit of technology, right, that's designed to change how you see the world. Um, and here comes the kind of the infamous line, which is death to Videodrome and long live the new flesh. Uh, the new flesh being this amalgamation of uh, technology, this changed flesh, this changed subject, which has been uh, made brand new. Uh, the very final, uh, the very final scene. I'm not going to play this one in full, um, but it ends with uh, Max finding his way to the docks, where he has a vision or a hallucination or a encounter with Nikki on another screen, uh, who tells him that he has to transcend the old flesh, and it ends uh, with uh, uh, Max saying, "Long live the new flesh," uh, and shooting himself uh, in the head. Um, the, uh, there was a cut ending which saw uh, Max and Nikki reunited uh, on the on the Videodrome set, which has recurred throughout the film, in a kind of liquefied, organic intermingling of subjects, which would have been really interesting. Um, but I want to kind of make a what might seem like a bit of a provocative okay. point, which okay. is that maybe we might now see the ending of Videodrome as too optimistic. Uh, can Videodrome be killed off? Can there really be death to Videodrome and let the flesh become something new? Is that even something that we want now? Uh, I've included a quote here from a, a Wired article which came out a little while ago. Um, when we pause um, to, to kind of do some Q&A and discussion, I'm going to put the link to the article in the chat, but it's about virtual reality. And it uses this very chilling one-line pull quote that I've decided to borrow, which is that if you want a picture of the future, Imagine a Facebook branded set of VR goggles strapped to an emaciated human face forever. Really, uh, the, the old flesh, uh, our bodies are, are subject to the whims of economic distribution, to, to political inequality. And rather than trying to solve those problems, which are hard and probably unpopular with the people with lots of money, uh, VR uh, experts are, are quite seriously just talking about, well, let's, let's not worry about the physical world, let's create a new world. Let's uh, let us create a kind of perfect video drone for all where everyone can be a kind of uh, Adonis in their own virtual reality world. And here we can see Stigler's point that techniques can close down possibilities for individual and collective human flourishing. You see, what comes up repeatedly in Cronenberg's films is this notion that transformation of the body, the, the body transforming into something is kind of terrifying and, and scary and maybe slightly gross, but it's, there's also something about it that's appealing. Um, you know, Max, uh, when the gun kind of grows into his hand, doesn't seem particularly repulsed. You know, when he starts to merge with technology, when he starts to, to, to embody the new flesh, there is something about it which has an appeal to it, right? As well as a kind of cost. Uh, and really, a film that we uh, can see that very clearly in is The Fly from 1986. And this is one of my favorite quotes from The Fly, which is the flesh, it should make the computer crazy. 
Uh, so for those of you who have not seen it, um, which I imagine is not very many of you, the, the Fly stars Gina Davis and Jeff Goldblum. Uh, Jeff Goldblum is uh, Seth Brundle, a super talented uh, scientist who is working on teleportation. Uh, and he's starting to crack it, but the computer can't quite get it right. You know, the flesh uh, is synthetic when it's transferred. It doesn't feel real. Uh, he meets Gene Davis's character, Ronnie, and they, they have a kind of meet cute. And what I actually think is quite a, quite a sincere and, and genuine chemistry. Uh, and you sort of think that, you know, two lonely people have found one another. And one night, uh, Seth gets drunk, puts himself into his teleportation booth, and does not notice that there is something else in there with him and is, is made into something new. Um, so a kind of few questions from the fly, which is like, what does it mean to love someone who will inevitably end up as someone or something else? And this is something that came up in the chat earlier, you know, this idea of how do we live with the reality of things like death, disease, bodily contingency, the fact that often bodies are very strange, we can often feel alienated even from our own body. Um, and this is a quote from Cronenberg where he says that, that because of our necessity to impose upon our structure, our own structure of perception on things, we look on ourselves as being relatively stable. But in fact, when I look at a person, I see this maelstrom of organic, chemical and electron chaos, volatility and instability shimmering and the ability to change and transform and transmute. Uh, here's, here's the kind of direct quote from the film. Ronnie uh, says, it, Seth says he's figured out what the disease wants. Uh, so Ronnie says, what does the disease want? And Seth says it wants to turn me into something else. That's not too terrible, is it? Most people would give anything to be turned into something else. Uh, transformation is terrifying, but exciting. But there, there is a price that's paid by it. Uh, so here we, we kind of see the first realizations. They've, uh, Ronnie and uh, Seth have had a fight. He's run off to a bar. He's come home with somebody else. Uh, and uh, Ronnie is starting to realize that there is uh, something going on with him. Um, and we will see how this goes. We go through, we realize that actually he is changing into something. Uh, the The uh, fusion with uh, the fly that was in the teleporter pod that he was in uh, advances through his body. There is there are a couple of bits of genuinely pretty gross body horror which I have decided not to show, um, mostly because I have a thing about fingernails and teeth, um, which I decided not to include because that even gets to me. Um, but uh, Ronnie comes back to check on him and realizes that uh, things are not going very well. See the kind of exhilaration of bodily transformation at first, right? He says he's been liberated. He's been set free. He doesn't need the kind of old connections that he used to have. Uh, but transformation is exciting. It's liberatory. We want to go beyond the kind of limits of normal human existence. Uh, and then we kind of see its reality, see the kind of cost of it. And finally, I'm jumping ahead here uh, to a very famous speech towards the end of the film about insect politics. I... I find really kind of powerful about that final scene is there is a kind of tension that's visible in, uh, particularly in Goldblum's performance, I think, between the recognition of what you were and the realization of what you might be turning into. Uh, the, 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 the glimpse of familiarity back to a maybe past version of yourself and the, the, the ability to look forward to see something kind of, as he puts it, far more brutal that you're going to become. Um, it's a super interesting film. I think if you've never seen The Fly, it's well worth checking out. Um, and as I say, Gene Davis and Jeff Goldblum in it are both excellent. The body horror in it is superb. Uh, some of the best practical effects uh, of the 80s, in my opinion. Um, it's frequently read as an AIDS narrative, obviously, given the historical context of its production. But Cronenberg says that the film is actually more about things like terminal illness and particularly aging. Um, and so I wanted to close by posing a question to everybody. 
So if we had a vision of the body that was capacious enough to deal with our own inherent instability and contingency, how would that impact how we related to one another? You know, how can body horror change how we think about bodies, ourselves, and the way those things meet in the world? I will stop there and say thank you so much for being here. Uh, you can find Horror Vanguard wherever you get your podcasts or whatever pod, podcast store you like to go to. Um, it's, uh, it's Patreon is up there for bonus episodes and to support the show. Come find me on Twitter and say hello. And you can also uh, drop something in my PayPal tip jar, uh, the link to which is up on the screen. But thank you so much. I would be really interested to see what everyone has to say in the chat. <laughs>